economics. Uh, we are repeating today lecture uh, 21. Uh, this is our second lecture on business cycles. Uh, first lecture we discussed mostly the economic behavior of GDP. What we do today is I have outlined 17 or 18 different uh, yeah, macroeconomic variables. So this lecture is called Macroeconomic Indicators and how they behave throughout the business cycles. Sometimes they are simply known as business cycle indicators. This is what professional macroeconomists use to determine whether they are in, where they are in the business cycle, whether they are past the peak or still before the peak, or if, they, if the economy is in bust, whether they are already in revival mode, which means past the trough or before the trough. Uh, I will click, quickly explain what different uh, variables mean. Pro-cyclical simply means that it moves and flows together with the business cycle. When the business cycle is going up, the pro-cyclical variable is going up. And when the business cycle goes down, it correspondingly goes down with it. The counter-cyclical variable is the one that goes in the exactly opposite direction. When the cycle goes up, the variable goes down. And when the cycle goes down, the variable goes up. In economics or in statistics, we say that uh, they are negatively correlated. So counter-cyclical variables are negatively correlated to the business cycle. We also have some variables that are acyclical. Acyclical simply means that they are not in any way to the, related to the business cycle. When the business cycle is booming, they may be going up, they may be going down. It is not quite clear upfront what their behavior is, or at least historically they don't show any consistent behavior with the business cycle. Now, what we focus today is mostly on the next two, which are leading indicators and lagging indicators. As we will see, almost all of the variables, except for a couple, are pro-cyclical. They behave the same and co-float with the business cycle. So for them, just saying that they go up with the cycle or down with the cycle is not interesting. Real understanding of the economy shows to understand whether the variable peaks before the <coughs> overall peak or peaks after. So if it's peaking before, we say that the variable is leading. And if it's peaking after, we say that the variable is lagging. Correspondingly with the trough, if it bottoms before the trough, if it, it is leading. And if it's bottoming after the trough, it is lagging. Some variables have the property to lead both at the peak and at the trough. Other variables may bottom before both or after both. And some variables may exhibit a mixed behavior, peak before the one and after the other. So they may have a lead lag nature. So what is important to understand is what the behavior is. And secondly, I have outlined for each one of these what the economic or the arguments are, what the reasons are. Uh, any questions so far? All right, so what we do now is move through the five key macroeconomic variables, and then we move to other uh, variables. These we call primary variables. The, the others we call secondary variables. We start first with consumption. You can easily see consumption is pro-cyclical, increases with boom, and falls with the bust. But what is important to understand that consumption is lagging at the peak. So it peaks after the business cycle peaks. Question is why? And first and foremost, it is important to understand that consumers are usually late in observing the business cycle. They are not experts. 
they don't have key indicators for themselves. They usually observe employment, but they don't have direct indicator telling them whether the economy is still peaking or is already past its peak. So that's the second, no direct indicators. The third reason that consumption is uh, lagging is that consumers usually are inertial by nature. They usually cut their consumption only after they observe massive unemployment or only after they observe that they themselves get personally laid off. So they are not keen to seeing the boom, but they're also keen on continuing to consume until they actually see their neighbors, friends, relatives lose their jobs. Only then they become cautious and cut down on their spending. So consumers are also lagging up the trough. First and foremost, they must be convinced that the trough is over. A bus may last three, five, eight, ten, twelve years. The Great Depression lasted more than that. So if consumers see for four or five years an economic depression, they are usually not going to begin to consume right away with the bull. They would want to see the boom lasting for six months, maybe for a year, maybe even more, and only then they'll become confident in expanding their purchases, the cars, stoves, other durables, vacations, etc. Until they're convinced, they are overall cautious. A second reason why uh, consumers lag in their consumption of the trough is that Hiring doesn't pick up immediately, which means that as the business cycle bottoms, businesses do not hire immediately with the revival. Usually businesses begin to hire one, two years afterwards. They hire with a lag and <coughs> say a lot more about it in point six. So that's number two. Number three reason that consumers don't pick up their buying immediately is that at the very trough, credit is still tight. Banks are still cautious to lend, so they aren't lending especially to consumers. Banks want to see the boom stay for a while, and they want to see that the unemployment picture is improving, and only then they'll loosen credit. So if you're at the bottom, you want to buy that fridge or stove, but you already suffered three, four, five years of depression, you don't have the money, usually you got to get it from the bank. And bank isn't going to give it at the trough. It's going to give it months or maybe years later. All right, the hardest one to discuss is usually investments. And investments are strictly pro-cyclical. They are coincident or identical with the peak and coincident with the trough. This is the only variable that is coincident at both the peak and the trough. Some modern economists actually prefer rather than argue about investments in their behavior in the business cycle, prefer to define the business cycle as investment behavior. So whether the business cycle peaks or trough is defined as investments peaking and troughing, it's fairly straightforward, very hard to argue why it's not leading or lagging. I don't want to spend time on that. There are other variables that are substantially more important. Government spending. Government spending is the, the other very hard variable. First of all, it is not strictly economic variable based on economic fundamentals. It is based on tax <coughs> revenues. It is based on current government thinking. It is based on political stability. It is based on government's ability to borrow. It is based on government's willingness to spend. It is based on government's willingness to incur 
deficits. In other words, it is based on tons of subjective values, that, uh, 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 subjective uh, factors that are not uh, strictly determined by the economy itself, but by some other variables. Theoretically, government spending is meant to be and supposed to be counter-cyclical so as to act as stabilizer. When the economy is booming, government is supposed to spend less and cool off the economy. When the economy is in stagnation or recession, the government is supposed to spend more to pick up the economy. This is modern Keynesian theory or new Keynesian theory. In real life, however, government spending has been mostly pro-cyclical in nature because government collects a lot of money during the boom. It spends a whole lot more. And when the bust comes, profitability shrinks, wages shrink, and therefore tax revenues of the government shrink. And if the government doesn't have the money, it simply doesn't spend it. It borrows some, but it oftentimes cannot borrow enough to compensate an increased spending. Again, government spending is too subjective to be good for appropriate economic analysis or judgment of what it is. So, in lead, lack, be pro-cyclical, acyclical, counter-cyclical. Imports are pro-cyclical and they lag. They lag both a peak and a trough. It is a fundamentally simple reason. A lot of imports actually behave like consumption. In other words, a big chunk of consumption comes out of imports. So if consumption is lagging, imports will be lagging. And if consumption were leading, imports will be leading. <coughs> Another reason that imports are lagging is that they are usually used for investments. And sometimes completion of investments uh, in the early phase of the bust. A completion of investments still requires some more imports to complete uh, those investments. A fundamentally different reason is that imports arrive in the country with a lag. Differently stated, uh, orders are made, made months in advance. If you want to import for Christmas now, 27th of April is the time to order your Christmas stuff from China so that the Chinese can make them, load them, ship them, travel across the ocean so we can unload them, go through customs, distribute them, and so forth until they finally end up in consumers pockets or homes. So in this sense, orders I made six, nine, 12 months in advance, and they may be made during the peak, but the actual arrival of commodities will come months after the peak. OK, I already mentioned that investors continue to import to complete projects. What am I talking about? Well, we have a hotel built outside. That hotel is in the, sh in the phase of completion. You still need this, these aluminum windows, and we're still importing them, preferably from Germany. So we will still need those aluminum windows to continue to import from Germany to complete that hotel. All right, so why they lack at the trough? Well, they behave like consumption. I already said that. Uh, imports are also used uh, for investments. So usually as investments pick up, it takes time to order them, and only then they arrive. So, uh, so even if investments bottom exactly with the cycle, and businesses decide on the day of the bottom to increase investments, they have to order Import, the import will get in with a lag, six months, nine months, etc. And there is yet another reason related to international trade. Sometimes in a depressionary environment, countries use trade protectionist policies. They have import quotas, tariffs, etc. Usually governments are always late in their 
cha in changing their policies. So governments would want to see one, maybe two years of strong economy, and only then they lower import quotas. So if governments release or remove import quotas with a certain lag, then imports will be arriving in the country with a certain lag. Now, exports are relatively acyclical. They are much more dependent on foreign demand than on our own demand production or anything else. So foreigners may be in a boom, we may be in a bust, or they may be in a bust, and we may be in a bust. Uh, as long as our cycle does not correlate to the foreigner cycle, so exports will be a cyclical. Also, exports depend traditionally on exchange rates, and exchange rates sometimes are not well related to business cycles. So they may fluctuate, they don't have a good correlation, and if exports are dependent on exchange rates, but exchange rates don't correlate with the business cycle, then exports are also not expected to be correlated well with the business cycle. They may be pro-cyclical, they may be counter-cyclical, but they're best categorized as acyclical. Similar arguments hold for the trough. Okay, then we move on to unemployment. Ah, question. What's that? I think like exports are, are more counter-cyclical than Wow, I forgot this name. Okay, so, so you think exports are what? Well, they may be more, but uh, let's say if, if uh, our economy is booming and foreign economy is booming, they will be pro-cyclical. Foreigners will be buying more and more and more, and if they're buying more, then it will be pro-cyclical. Uh, as I'm saying, it may be more under some circumstances. It may be counter-cyclical under other circumstances. Not quite clear which one it is. Okay, so uh, we move to unemployment or it is be better understood as labor utilization. So how much of the labor pool is being utilized? And unemployment usually works with a lead at the peak and with a lag at the trough. It is a mixed type variable. First of all, unemployment uh, will work with a lead because businesses will get that lead indicator from inventories. As we'll see later on, inventory changes are a strong lead indicator that the business cycle has peaked or has troughed. So businesses can first see that the peak is coming or has come or is coming in the future, in the soon. So they will react first with employment. And second of all, employment grows slower than the labor force. This means that around the peak or close to the peak, the economy may be growing very slowly, maybe 1%, but the labor pool will be growing at whatever demographics determine the labor pool, how many kids are graduating from high school or from college. So if kids are normally growing at, let's say, 3% rates, if, unemployment, uh, sorry, if the economy is absorbing 4%, absorbing unemployment will be falling. And if the economy is growing and absorbing only 1%, unemployment will be rising. So if the economy around the peak or as the economy around the peak grows slower to absorb all the new entrants in the labor force, unemployment will rise and will begin to rise further. It's also counter-cyclical. Unemployment moves in exactly the opposite direction. Uh, peak um, uh, is associated with low unemployment and vice versa. Versa. Now, the question is, though, why unemployment is lagging at the trough? Well, first of all, the explanation lies in, an econo in a concept in economics called a labor hoard. Labor hoard means that when the employer is laying off people throughout the bus, he's not laying off 
everybody that he or she doesn't need. They will keep some people more. So if you have, let's say, 12 cleaning ladies or 12 professors and there is a slowdown, you need only eight. You're not going to lay off all four. You're going to lay only two and the rest you're going to use a little bit less time. Maybe some you'll use half time. Maybe you use a 75 percent. So when the economy picks up, they will get to reutilize those underutilized workers. The reason they want to keep them underutilized is that it is better to keep them un underutilized than to run the cost of laying them off, paying severance, pa severance packages, etc., and then rehiring them back usually takes some time to rehire and usually rehiring is also associated with a lot of costs. So uh, firing and hiring is a costly procedure. Employers prefer to hoard some labor during bad times and redeploy later. The other reason also associated with the labor hoard, that's actually why I have one A and one B here, is of hours worked. As the economy slows down, rather than working workers eight or nine hours, employers will work them six or seven hours, will pay them accordingly. And as the economy bottoms and begins to pick up, employers don't hire immediately. They usually begin to increase hours worked. And only after they've reached a meaningful threshold, let's just call it eight hours, only then they'll begin to absorb new workers. So you need some time for the boom to go on before employers begin actively hiring. Well, in the meantime, kids are graduating school and entering the labor force, so the unemployment continues to uh, increase. Okay, uh, what else? Uh, employ businesses, rehire. Okay, so another reason actually is that businesses not simply rehire when they absorb the labor hoard, but they also rehire only after they are sure that the boom is to stay. What I explained so far was businesses have an indicator whether the, there is a revival. In other words, whether the economy has bottomed and is picking up. But just because the economy is picking up, businessmen will not hire immediately. Sometimes businessmen have observed that the economy may pick up for a year and then relapse in a stagnation or depression again. So what employers want to see is that the boom or the revival is strong is healthy, is going to last for many years, and therefore it is worth hiring and training new workers. There is yet another reason why unemployment lags, and it's related to uh, high un uh, oh, oh, sorry guys, that's, that's on, uh, yeah, that's unemployment. It's also that high unemployment keeps wages from rising. That's actually uh, an argument on the wages. That seems like a mistake. Let's move on to capacity utilization. What is it? Okay, let's do that. Okay, so they rehire them. Is that what it is? Yes. Sure. Yeah. Tenure. Yes. That they can't be fired. So that's. But but we're currently talking at the trough. At the trough. So what high unemployment does keep wages from rising. Here the argument is that once the economy picks up, rather than hiring new people, sometimes it is better to raise the wages of the current people and use them more. So rather than hire a new person, you pay the cleaning lady rather than $5 an hour, $6 an hour, and she works harder and more. So early on, there are a lot of slack resources that businesses try to reuse before they really get to hiring new people. Okay, next we move to capacity utilization rate. Capacity refers to investment or production capacity. It refers to capital. That's why I also used 
capital utilization. What is important to understand is a very general, broad economic concept that capital utilization should usually use and have the same behavior and the same logic to it applied as labor utilization. Okay, so why does it lead capital utilization rate? Well, number one, accumulating inventories will signal to business to utilize less. So even before the peak has arrived, businesses seeing increasing inventories will say, oh, we got to utilize less, we got to produce less. So the driver of this whole thing is increasing or lowering inventories. So inventories increasing is going to be a strong I indicator that consumers aren't buying, and if they aren't buying, we should be using less production capacity. So that's number one. I've already indicated behaves like employment. But there is a third fundamental reason, and that is a boom in general is also an investment boom. So an investment boom means that as the economy is growing and accelerating, investments are also growing and accelerating. But what is important to understand is that investments come online to produce with a major lag. You may be building a hotel, but it's not going to come in one night. It's going to take one year. So the point to understand is that as the economy slows down, new capital arrives productive because it was started one or two or three years ago. So capital begins to increase a lot and continues to increase as the economy is speaking. But if the available capital continues to increase but you use less of it, then the result will be it will peak before the business cycle peaks. Now, why is it lagging? Well, most of the logic applies, which is similar to employment. But also another reason is, as indicated, depleting inventories will signal to utilize more capital. So usually, uh, once they begin to utilize more capital, it lags because you can't kick in production today. You see depleting inventories, but it doesn't mean you turn on a switch and production begins. That's not how it works. You have to order materials. You have to order a whole bunch of things. You've got to set up the production line. In other words, to begin production of something or to accelerate production of something usually takes a lag, a considerable lag. Sometimes it may even take six months or a year to order the material from abroad. For example, you produce computers, you got to order the RAM memory chips. So you got to wait them to come from Taiwan and only then you can ramp up production and thereby capacity utilization. So that's another reason right there. CPI is usually coincident, is usually procyclical, leading at the peak and coincident at the lag. It is leading at the peak because producer supply is, dri is the driving force. This simply means that uh, uh, producers supply more and more and more, and they continue to supply. So their supply is driving inflation to lead. As demand slows down around the peak, but, but producers continue offering and supplying, they will push inflation lower sooner. So, uh, for example, three months before the peak, producers are continuing to offer 5 or 6 percent growth of output, but consumers aren't willing to consume 6 percent. They're willing to consume only 1 percent more. So they continue to increase at a lower rate, and the very high supply will push inflation lower. So that's the very first argument. The second argument is that CPI inflation leads because increasing inventories, and they begin to increase before the peak, will tell producers increasing inventories, you have to lower the price. So increasing inventories signal 
that they should, that producers should lower their prices. And increasing or accumulating inventories signal this before the peak has arrived. And moreover, as I've indicated within the same argument, a lot of times accumulating inventories even force very early, well before the peak, they force substantially lower prices. I remember, let's say in the United States, 1999, there was such a huge supply of cars, they were growing supply at huge levels, and everybody that needed a car, wanted a car, already had a car. So consumers aren't, weren't willing to buy. They already had cars. I had bought one in 1998. I didn't want to buy another one in 99. So they had to lower car prices drastically. Well, that will be a good indicator that the peak is coming soon and that the economy will tip in recession soon. Okay, why CPI is mostly coincident, in other words, it bottoms together. Well, number one is during the peak, supply is the driving force, but at the bottom, it is demand the driving force. At the bottom, businesses keep very low inventories. They've cleared inventories. So as soon as consumer demand picks up and they want to buy more, there isn't enough inventory. So the reaction for businesses is begin raising prices because they cannot supply immediately. It takes them a lag, six months, a year, or two years to begin producing again and supplying again. So as supply is unresponsive at the bottom, demand is the driving force. The minute demand picks up, so does CPI. Okay, inventories I've indicated are minimal at the bottom, and higher demand translates into higher prices. Actually, this is one argument into three separate sub-pieces. Okay, now we move to GDP deflator. Now, what's important to understand is that CPI uses only consumer goods, only consumer goods, bread, wine, uh, stuff like that, maybe watches. Well, GDP deflator may use also materials like bricks. It may use other prices of capital goods. It may even use prices like cars trucks, etc. So besides consumer goods, it uses a wide range of capital goods. So CPI, we can say, uses predominantly low order capital goods, while GDP deflator uses both a low order capital goods and high order capital goods, uses some average of them. So why the G deflator is lagging at the peak? Well, it is lagging at the peak because at the peak, even though CPI may be falling, high order capital goods continue to rise. They continue to rise because there may be thousands of hotels that are still currently built. There are lots of construction projects, lots of investments going on around the peak, and they will need the capital to complete them. So while consumers can react from today till tomorrow and they can drop their demand except for maybe food and medicine, businessmen cannot react immediately. They have to complete the project that they have started. So they will necessarily drive or continue to drive as happens during the boom, higher order capital good prices even higher. So the, even though the CPI isn't uh, reacting, the high order capital good prices will continue to rise and they'll continue to rise past the peak or after the peak. That's why we call it its uh, lagging. Also, it's the same logic goes here as the bust continues or begins a lot of businessmen will continue in desperation to complete their project. So they will be eager to bid higher prices for bricks, cement, aluminum windows, etc., just to get their hotel completed and get it operational. So that's the reason for lagging here. Logic pretty much applies 
for, a, a, uh, for, for the bottom. Why it's lagging is because uh, at the bottom, high order capital goods prices fall and they continue to fall. So even though low order capital goods prices may begin to rise at the revival, high order capital goods prices still fall. So they drag down the average GDP deflator. And they keep it dragging usually a couple of months after the economy itself has already bottomed. Okay, now we move to inventory levels and to delta inventories, which stands for changes in inventories. It's a lot easier to discuss changes in inventories. Well, changes in inventories are the main indicator, the main signal that the market economy has at its disposal to businessmen to tell them whether they're producing too much or too little. Increasing inventory tells a businessman to produce less and therefore signals him to lower production, which is indicative of a peak. And a close to a bottom, small or lower inventory tells him to produce more. So this is the primary mechanism in the market economy to tell businessmen produce more or less. The other primary indicator is that of profits. Higher profits and more profits are the other fundamental signal. Therefore, you would also expect, just like changes in inventories, you'd also expect uh, corporate profits to lead because they have the same effect. Okay, so this is related to changes in inventories. Well, what about inventory levels? Well, inventory levels are lagging. So as inventories begin to increase, they continue to increase even after the peak has occurred. Why? Because production takes time to stop. If you're producing cars, you cannot stop your production immediately. You've ordered tires, you've ordered parts, you've ordered everything. If you want to stop the production today, you'll take or pick up all of your deliveries of uh, materials. You'll complete the production and maybe nine or twelve months down the road you will then be able to slow down that production. So even though uh, the economy has peaked, you continue to produce more and to accumulate to clear out the production pipeline. Okay, production pipeline takes time to clear. It is part of the same argument. And also it trails lagging consumption. Consumption continues, to, uh, continues after the peak, so once consumption slows after the peak, Inventories suddenly, suddenly slow uh, after the peak, meaning they begin to accumulate at that time or to continue to accumulate. So it trails, in a sense, or lags consumption. Now, why would that be the case for uh, lagging at the bottom? Well, similar argument about the production pipeline. If you want to fill the pipeline, you don't do this in one day. You gotta order the chips, the tires, whatever you need to produce from somewhere else. Someone else has gotta produce them. So in the meantime as the economy is picking up and demand is picking up, you cannot keep up with demand simply because it takes a couple of months, three, six, nine months to begin producing and satisfy demand out of production. In the meantime, you're satisfying demand out of inventories. So your inventories continue to fall even though the business cycle has begun to rise. Delta in inventories are already covered. Uh, we move on to corporate profits. Well, first and foremost, uh, they are the primary signal for businessmen. So usually uh, peak in corporate profits are indicative that the business cycle will peak very soon. And similarly, bottoming profits will indicate that the business cycle is bottoming very soon. One of the reasons that they lead is that uh, profits track 
prices. So if prices get to fall or not rise, then profits will get to fall or not rise. So that's one of the fundamental reasons. Another fundamental reason is that even before the economy has peaked, inventories begin to accumulate and sales slow down. So uh, accumulating inventories and slower sales translate into lower profits. So that's why they also peak. And there is one other fundamental reason is that as the economy is approaching its boom, uh, sorry, its peak during the boom, high order capital goods prices rise faster than low order capital goods prices. This is to say that costs continue to rise and rise faster than prices, sales prices or revenues. So faster rising costs do result ultimately in lower profit margins and lower profit margins result in lower profits. At the bottom they also lead one uh, units sold increase and not only the units sold increase at the bottom or around the bottom but also you can get also higher price. Another one, this combination of higher price and uh, it also adds profits margins so the margin, the profitability of one unit increases. But there is yet another reason, close to the bottom, input costs continue to fall. So during the boom, in input costs rise faster than prices, so they erode profit margins. But around the bottom, input prices continue to fall, so they widen the profit margin. So this signals to businessmen that more profits are made and you got to produce more and they react soon enough. Okay, so nominal wage growth. Nominal wage growth is lagging at both. First and foremost is rising unemployment becomes structural or uh, sectoral. In other words, as the economy is, is booming, it continues, it continues to suck people, it continues to demand people. In 2000, 2001, the economy in the U.S. has peaked, but it was still demanding computer specialists and was driving computer specialist wages higher and higher. So this demand continues to drive the overall wage level higher even though the economy has peaked. Now, because oops, no, wage, okay, wages are lagging is also the reason why consumption is lagging even though the economy has peaked because nominal wages continue to rise from number one consumption also continues to rise. Okay, let's see what else we have. Uh, booming sectors keep hiring, I already mentioned that one. Another reason is that nominal wages continue to track inflationary expectations. So, throughout the boom, inflationary expectations increase. People expect higher and higher and higher inflation as the boom goes on and on and on. Well, if that's the case, they factor in a higher and higher increase in their wages. So even though the economy has peaked, people have high inflationary expectations and they demand higher raises and they usually get them as a compensation of past inflation. So the economy peaks, but worker salaries continue to go higher, maybe for a year, maybe for two, sometimes maybe just six months. And there is one final reason. Labor, uh, labor unions almost always slow and delay wage growth. They, during the boom, they actually slow down workers' wage growth rather than workers getting 10% labor unions negotiate at 8%. So workers were getting less, and less than what they could throughout the boom. So at the peak, they can get some more and continue to get raises even though the economy is tipping into a recession. So that's another reason here. On the lag, labor hordes actually keep wages from rising. Have a lot of 
uh, people inside the company and they are not used well so you're gonna first reuse those people and only then you go on the free market to hire some more this simply means that at that point it will be six months or 12 months or 18 months later that you begin hiring and thereby drive wages higher okay what else do we have uh, minimum wage laws also prevent uh, uh, early hiring raises this simply means that if the law is at six dollars minimum but the workers got to be getting 575 or 590 and the employer simply has agreed to pay him six when the time comes right after the bottom to raise the work uh, the employer mentally raises it to six dollars but effectively the worker doesn't get a raise because he's already at six dollars and finally labor unions also slow in, in, in delay wage reductions at the bottom so well sorry during the bust so what happens is it rather than wages fall at ten percent from year to year the labor union slows the fall from every year from five to five to five percent and then wages are relatively high at the bottom so as overall wages pick up employers don't increase the wages of those so-called overpaid workers uh, any questions so far any questions is it is it fairly clear does it make sense okay so we move on to narrow money well narrow money at least within the Austrian framework and the same within the monetarist framework is the cause of the business cycle cause means that it precedes the business cycle so what you need is a monetary expansion or credit expansion and this will induce a boom and then you need monetary tightening or credit tightening or contraction and this will precede the bust so within monetarist and Austrian framework simply because it's the cause it is itself a leading indicator well a lot of things could be said but it, you know that would be a proper course for intermediate macroeconomics or for money and banking course absolutely the same arguments are valid for broad money broad money is the broad money supply it is actually the determinant of the business cycle what we should properly say is that narrow money is the determinant of broad money and the broad money is the determinant of the business cycle itself broad money in itself incorporates credit expansion so when credit expands this is part of broad money supply so broad money supply reflects credit expansion and thereby incorporates the cause of the business cycle itself so it's usually a great indicator to watch how money supply accelerates or decelerates and it tells you really well whether the economy is likely to accelerate or decelerate then we move on to long-term interest rates long-term interest rates usually lag and they lag for a number of reasons first and foremost businesses are still eager to borrow to complete projects so even though the economy is in bust they will be eager to get that last credit to complete the hotel or whatever service or whatever production they'll be making because otherwise they'll simply go bankrupt a second reason is that even though the economy has peaked inflationary expectations continue to rise because inflationary expectations are usually lagging and therefore inflationary expectations will be incorporated into nominal interest rates so nominal interest rates will be rising not simply because of higher demand but also because of higher compensation for inflation number three means that uh, interest rates will also incorporate a higher risk premium why would there be a high risk premium well very simple once the economy peaks and turns into a recession or stagnation 
the risk of bankruptcy increases substantially. The risk of inability to repay increases substantially. The risk of profits turning into losses increases substantially. So the overall risk of credits increases and the risk premium will increase to reflect that higher risk. And finally, related to the previous two reasons, 14 and 15, is tightness of money and credit. Usually at or actually before the peak money and credit becomes tight and tightening also means that it's harder to get you gotta pay effectively a higher price for it well what is a higher price for it just a higher long-term interest rate so that's yet another fundamental reason for it now, what about lagging? Well, they will be lagging because, uh, uh, because businesses will borrow after they have utilized their capacity or they have increased their capacity. For example, businesses working at 60% capacity at the bottom. As the economy picks up a year later, rather than investing and in borrowing to invest, business will use 70%. Two years later, they'll use 80%. Once they get to see that they're utilizing 85 or 90%, then they will begin to borrow, and then they'll begin to invest again. So it may be a couple of years because before they reinitiate their borrowing for investment purposes. So that's the reason or one of the reasons. The second reason is uh, logical. It, is, it applies through quite a lot of the logic of many of the lagging variables. It is that businesses will simply not borrow and invest unless and until they're sure that the boom is here to stay and it's going to be a strong economy for many years to come. So usually they want to see a couple of years of strong economy and then they'll go on the market and borrow. So if there is little borrowing right in the early revival, you would expect that long-term interest rates will be lagging. In other words, they'll continue to fall even though the economy is already in revival mode. We have two more short-term interest rates. They are, of course, pro-cyclical. Number one, they are lagging because Fed keeps raising to fight inflation. What does it mean? It means that short-term interest rates are an instrument of central bank monetary policy. As such, the central bank determines these interests. As the economy is moving higher and higher and higher into a boom, the Fed begins to raise interest rates and it raises short-term interest rates higher and higher and higher. Usually around the peak there are so high inflationary expectations that what the Fed has got to do is continue to raise short-term interest rates to kill inflationary or tame inflationary expectations. So often time the Fed continues to raise, well there you have it. The economy is already tipping into recession but the Fed keeps raising to fight inflation and inflationary expectations. And also a second fundamental reason that was uh, very well observed in 1999 is the economy was booming and stock market was going sky high. Uh, other real estate was going but not as sky high. The Fed felt compelled to increase interest rates so that it cools off the speculative stock market. It was considered and was recognized that it is a stock market bubble and the Fed decided to raise more than 10 times short-term interest rates just to burst the stock market bubble. Well, sometimes, well, oftentimes they continue to keep raising even past the peak. Sometimes the Fed wants to be sure that 
the bubble has burst and that there will be no revival anytime soon. Well, they had to revive it two and a half years later, but that's a different story after September 11. Okay, so short-term interest rates. Well, with the lag, it's the same reason. After the economy has bottomed and the economy is in slow revival, it's been recovering maybe one year, the Fed doesn't want to raise immediately interest rates with the recovery. What the Fed wants to do is want to keep interest rates low, maybe for a year, maybe for two, maybe even for three years, to make sure that the recovery takes hold and that the recovery is strong and that the recovery is once again in boom mode. And once they see that it's in boom mode, only then they will begin raising interest rates. Well, but economy is in boom mode maybe one or two years after it reached its bottom. So short-term interest rates bottom a couple of years after that. Okay, that's also the same one to Fed keep low to boost the recovery. Okay, and finally, the stock market. Uh, stock market is clearly a lending, uh, leading indicator. One of the reasons is stock market is a forecasting machine. It tries to forecast. If it smells a boom, it actually begins to rise. That's why it forecasts the boom in advance. If it smells a bust, it usually sells and peaks before the bust. bust so it's got a forecasting nature built into it. Uh, a second reason why it peaks before or leads is that stock markets got this ability to sniff over investment. It sees too many dot coms. It sees too many telecoms. It sees that an investment over investment is going on in a couple of industries and it decides to sell them off. In other words, it sees that over investment will lead to lower or negative profits, so they decide to sell based on over investment. So Sniffing over investment or figuring out that over investment is going on, they will sell in advance before the actual crash occurs. Another reason is that uh, if you're an investor, you definitely want to sell at the peak of the profits or even before profits peak. Remember, profits peak with a lead, maybe three months, maybe six months before the economy peaks. Well, the stock market will try to sniff peaking profits and will try to sell before profits peak or at the moment when profits peak. So that's yet another reason why they are leading. Another reason is again, also besides sniffing profits, is also tracking profits and profit expectations. So it's not only looking at what the profits are today, but it's also looking at what the profits uh, will look like in the future. So if profits will look poorer or worse in the future, stock market will also tip earlier or sooner with a lead. And yet another different reason is related to interest rates. Uh, usually stock market prices correlate with negatively with interest rates. Very high interest rates mean low stock prices. Low interest rates mean high, uh, high stock prices. So as the boom progresses on and on and on, Interest rates begin to increase higher and higher and higher, and around the peak, interest rates get to accelerate, and at that point, the accelerating interest rates actually turn the stock market down because the stock market can't handle the substantially increased interest rates. Logic for the stock market is at the bottom is pretty much the same. Stock market forecasts the boom in advance. Around the bottom, you may actually be, get, be getting in certain industries under investment. Why? A bust is associated with relatively low 
uh, investment activity. So if investments are low for five, six, or ten years, somewhere at the bottom you may have lots of underinvestment. Simply investments were needed but weren't made. So the stock market will sniff that there are more investments needed in the industry and will begin driving their stock prices higher. Okay, another reason is that profits bottom before the actual bottom occurs. So stock market will try to forecast profits bottoming and beginning to rise and the stock market will, will in turn begin to rise even before profits turn around. So that's yet another reason why it turns around before the cycle. It tracks the other reason, it's actually 2A and 2B. They're pretty much the same logic uh, together. It tracks closely profits and profits expectations. And finally, as the bust con uh, is over and you get a revival, interest rates continue to fall and fall. This is because interest rates, both long term and short term, are lagging. So further falling interest rates will stimulate stock prices. So lower and lower and lower stimulate, uh, uh, interest rates throughout the bust at some point will kick and boost stock prices and that usually occurs uh, around six to nine months before the bottom of the economy has been reached. So overall, in summary, what economists try to do is effectively date business cycles and determine where the business or when the business cycle has peaked and when it has bottomed. They usually use in the, uh, leading indicators to forecast how soon the economy may peak or may bottom. And they use lagging indicators to confirm that the economy has peaked or has bottom. It is also important for you simply to understand because that's how you can understand real life around you. You see costs, you see investments going on, you see profits, you see money supplies, you see all of these variables are effectively observable. So that's how you can understand what the business cycle is and how it behaves. Uh, as I've explained, why it behaves so is part of business cycle theory. All we're doing here is simply describing the behavior of these 18 variables throughout the business cycles. Well, we have 10 more minutes. Any questions? No questions? None. Okay, well, then I guess we're done for today, guys. All right. Enjoy.